University of California, Riverside. As you can see from his picture, he will talk about commutators and commuting, the specific aspects of what kind of commuting I will leave for him to explain to everyone here. As always, I ask everyone, please mute yourself and unmute yourself as you see fit to ask questions. I would all for the audience, all yours. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this, this has been a, uh, a great thing. I mean, um, you know, we miss, of course, the, the regular uh, February Furio talks and going and uh, visiting you guys uh, uh, in Maryland in, in February. But um, one, I mean, if there's anything good about the, the situation we are is that we can attend so many talks all over the place. And I, I wonder why we never did this before, right? We didn't need a pandemic to do this thing, but um, anyway. Um, so this was an attempt to a joke, uh, uh, my, my first slide. Uh, I've been working on commutator for a very long time, but I, I really learned about commuting uh, when I moved to Southern California. And uh, fortunately, I don't have to commute. I live very close to Campo, but, but people go through a lot of trouble trying to commute here. Um, so um, let's see if this works. Yeah. OK, so uh, what I want to talk about today uh, I'll, I'll give you some uh, background material, uh, and I, I apologize. I know some of you are a real expert on this, but um, I'll give you some background material and motivation for what uh, we'd like to present. And, and uh, the new results, uh, maybe not that new anymore anyway, but uh, uh, are with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Guijin Sue. Uh, he's at Beijing Normal University. So uh, going back in time, so um, the first uh, kind of result along the line of things we, we will talk about are the Koiman rockbram wise commutator. Um, they first study for the Hilbert transform, this, this simple uh, commuting operation. So you multiply uh, a function by uh, another function we'll refer as a symbol sometimes. B and then you multiply H by the same function and then you subtract the two. So if you try to represent that as a singular integral, uh, now your kernel was one over X minus Y for the Hilbert transform, now it become B of X minus B of Y. So you see that uh, there is some additional cancellation in this kernel, but well, that will depend on the function B uh, or, or the regularity of B, uh, but uh, it become an interesting object and of course, uh, since the Hilbert transform maps LP into LP for P between one and infinity, um, then it's very easy to see that each term, um, so if you take a function in LP and a function on B in LQ, uh, then each of the terms of the commutator uh, will map, um, each of these terms will map LR into LR where, uh, you know, is given by Helder relation, right? So. Um, so you're not exploiting this cancellation at all, that each term will have the same, it will be as good as the difference of the two. However, uh, maybe one can exploit that cancellation and obtain something better. And that's what Koeman, Robert and Y discover, uh, that if you, so if you take a function in L infinity, this trivially will map LP into LP, but if you, you can put actually a function in a larger space, which is BMO. Right, and still the estimate uh, remain. Okay, and uh, they did it for the Hilbert transform, but then many other results follow, and the same result is true. Uh, if you replace, there's nothing particular about the Hilbert transform beyond being a calderon sigmund operator. So any calderon sigmund operator will have the same property. So uh, later on, Chanilo extended it to uh, some other uh, integral operator. These are simpler and easier to study because um, they are a positive operator and uh, locally they are integrable in the kernel. So, but the same is true. So uh, again, it's trivial if you put a function B in L infinity uh, and this operator map according to the Sobole relation uh, LP into LQ, where P and Q are related uh, by this uh, relation here. And um, the interesting thing again here is that you can replace L infinity for the symbol by BMO. So you put the large space and the SMA is still whole. And then this generated a whole industry. So there are a lot of 
Uh, this was studied in many contexts, you know, different kinds of spaces outside the Euclidean setting and with many type of operator. And, and essentially that's the, the key thing is typically that you can commute uh, many classical operator with VMO functions. Um, and that is a, uh, a nice role again of playing by VMO replacing uh, the space L infinity. So I have our multilinear. I, I'm going to focus on bilinear, but multilinear is the same. So uh, this take, you know, fast forward quite a few years. Uh, it took a little longer to develop. So uh, for those of you that may not be familiar with this, uh, I will be using the notion of multilinear Calderon Sigmund operators. Um, these are essentially operators that when you look at their kernel, so they are on product of uh, LP spaces. And a, a good way to think of a multilinear operator is to figure the product of function. And that gives you an idea what the indices should be related. So by Helder relation. Um, and so what is an M Calderon Sigma operator if there are M functions on which they act? It's linear in every entry and it has a kernel that is like the kernel of a Calderon Sigma function uh, of Calderon Sigma operator by an M times N number of dimensions. So for example, if I have a bilinear operator, the estimate on the kernel, which is singular still, but they will be like the estimate on the kernel of a Calderon Sigma, a linear Calderon Sigma operator in double the number of dimensions, right? And you know, every time you take a derivative in alpha, you decrease this by alpha. In fact, you don't need this for many derivatives, you just need it maybe for uh, alpha equal to zero, so the function itself, and one derivative will be enough. So there were many results over the years that uh, uh, finalized understanding this type of operator. So I, I just listed some along the way. So a lot of original work by like Koeman and Meyer, then uh, Chris and Journet, Kenyan and Stein, and then uh, Grafaco and myself uh, in the early 2000s. Okay, so how we define the commutator of uh, um, multilinear Calderon Sigma operator. So uh, again, this operator are on uh, M tuple of function. And so now you're gonna commute with another M tuple of functions B. And so um, by this complicated notation, what just I'm saying, I'm trying to identify with this J that I'm just taking the commutator as if I were freezing all the entries and I just commute in the J position, right? So this is like the commutator I showed before for linear singular inter, I said that um, we commute in each entry. And then, uh, and this is really for uh, technical convenience, we form the sum of all these. So we commute with a different function BJ in the J entry, and then we sum all them. It's really, this additional sum doesn't produce anything. Uh, all the estimates are term by term, but uh, for other purposes that I will not discuss today, it's convenient to look at the sum of all these. Uh, so here is in terms of, of the kernel uh, as, as an integral, which of course needs to be properly understood because it's, it's no conversion in general, but uh, absolutely it's no conversion. Uh, but you can imagine, uh, so again, uh, for each of the entry you commute, uh, so you have a, an additional cancellation um, given by the symbol B. Okay, and the result, not surprising perhaps, but it requires some work, is that uh, if you take the symbols to be in BMO, uh, then the commutator preserve, it has the same bounded estimate as the operator itself uh, when the function are in BMO. So in particular, the norm is controlled by the sum of this BMO norm, the operator norm. Okay, so and, and in terms of history, this was first done uh, in a short work with Carlos Perez when R was bigger than one. And the restriction there was because uh, we were using some weighted estimate and something uh, known as the Cauchy integral trick, uh, also developed first by Koeman, uh, Koeman Rockwell, and Weiss. And so we, we have some restriction on the target space LR. So remember um, this operator map uh, below uh, one. Uh, so for example, uh, the limiting case when you are in the bilinear case is R equal one half, not R equal to one. And so uh, the technique we use good work for that. And then um, we need an extra uh, effort to get the full range. And this was done uh, 
independently by Tang and uh, by Lenny Ambrosi uh, Perez, Trujillo, Gonzalez, and myself. And uh, in fact, uh, Tan proved some estimate related to the classical AP weights, uh, while us uh, show in, in the same word that there's a larger class of weights uh, that were for the multilinear Calderon signal theory. Um, I, I won't have time to talk about that, but it's, it's not just the pro of the AP classes, uh, there's a larger class of weights uh, that can be considered when one has uh, multilinear operators. So all what I will say um, from now on, I will concentrate on the bilinear case so that the notation uh, doesn't mess, confuse uh, what we're trying to do. Um, and in fact, they are, so everything can be extended to the M linear situation. And in fact, there are other uh, generalization. One can iterate this commutator, can repeatedly uh, uh, co commute again. And so uh, one can see what happened there. And also, we can introduce uh, weighted LP spaces, uh, but I will not talk about that. OK, so um, the same with operators like the fractional uh, singular integral. There is a uh, bilinear version of them. Um, they were studied by uh, Kenny and Stein and, and Grafakos al um, So uh, and again, the SMA1 spec are are the same as uh, you know given by the uh, homogeneity by the relation between the indices and and then the estimate remain true so the same estimate that the operator have they have if you commute with uh, a BMO function so here the one they're not commutating in the first uh, entry and here the two uh, relate to commutation in the second entry and these were obtained by uh, Lian, uh, Gu, Chen, and Sui. So um, probably go without saying, but every time one look at the uh, fractional singular integral, things tends to be uh, a little bit easier or sometimes a lot easier because um, two things, one, one can treat uh, with this operator have a positive kernel. And so cancellation doesn't play a role in the definition of the operator itself. And of course, the local integrability of the kernel uh, also help in many situations. Okay, so how about compactness? Well, uh, remember in the in the linear commute or in the multilinear one, there is this term now in the this factor. Sorry, in the integration, there is b of x minus b of y. So um, BMO doesn't provide much cancellation, but it's enough to get bound. Then one can speculate uh, that if we add additional smoothness to the function B, uh, then you know the kernel has better estimate, it becomes uh, nicer. And so maybe the operator is not only bounded, uh, but it maybe is something better than body. For example, it could be compact. And in fact, this was proved uh, by Uchiyama in 78. <clears throat> He looked at the space uh, that he called CMO, um, sometimes referred as continuum mean oscillation. Um, and um, for him, the space he's working in RN um, is the space of say infinity function with compact support. Uh, that's what I denote by C infinity zero. And then you take the closure in the VMO norm, in the VMO norm of a smooth function with compact support. And what Uchiyama was able to prove is that then this operator is compact from LP to LP, provided P is bigger than one, um, as the same range for the boundedness. So if, if instead of taking a BMO function, you take smooth function in BMO, um, well, in this case, it's infinity with compact support, so it will be automatic in BMO. You take the closure of that, uh, then um, that provide uh, compact operator. There's some confusion sometimes in the literature. Some people will call this space V, uh, VMO. Um, that's vanishing mean oscillation, uh, the space introduced by Saracen. Uh, however, um, that, I, and I will mention that space later on again, um, you know, Saracen introducing the Toro. So in the Toro, the two space coincide, but not, not in our end. So I prefer to use the Uchiyama notation and call this space CMO. 
Uh, actually, it was on the line, uh, um, Saracen. Oh, okay. I, I thought but, it was on the But, um, but, okay, that's good. That's good. Uh, thank you. Uh, all right. So, um, and, and this was first as a curiosity, but then, uh, or, or I don't know if the curiosity, but the results just about uh, singular integral, then he found other application uh, by Cohen, Malion, Meyer, and Sams in terms of compensated compactness and some other uh, PD were by Ivanik and so forth. Okay. So what is a, I, we, we're gonna do something similar, but we're gonna look at bilinear uh, compact operators or compact bilinear operators. So, you know, uh, if you never thought of what a compact bilinear operator is, um, and you know we haven't until ARPA, where I saw he's he's in he's in the audience uh, when they came to me and he said, "What is a compact bilinear operator?" He said, "It's just take you two seconds, right? You think well, what it should be? Well, uh, there are many definitions that one can think, but the simpler one is that um, you apply t to the product of the uniball and you get a pre-compact set, right? That's the normal thing." Uh, to think about a compact uh, bilinear operator would be. And in fact, they, this has been studied uh, quite a bit and I, we were, uh, it was interesting to to see that we, we could trace it back. Maybe there are uh, prior uh, uh, study, but uh, we trace it back all the way to Calderon in his famous paper about interpolation. So that was uh, something nice to find out. And as I say, of course, there are many equivalent definitions, the same that work in the linear case one can with some effort uh, prove it in the bilinear case. There are, there are in particular two very important properties. Uh, um, one that is, uh, it, it makes this interesting uh, and the, uh, in terms of that it's not just why, why don't you do things in each, in each component. In the other is a very important property that is very useful in the linear case and it will become very useful in this context too. So the first one is, uh, can you just look at the, uh, section or the traces of these operators. So you say you freeze one, one variable and look at the other. Well, uh, of course, if you have a bilinear compact operator, then the section are linear compact operator themselves, but the converse is not always true. So that means that if you're trying to determine compactness, you cannot just look at the traces of this operator. And the other one <clears throat> is that even in the quasi vana case, um, you know, uh, the fancy way to say is that the 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 service, uh, the if you look at the compact linear operator uh, um, as in the operator node, then uh, it's a closed linear subspace. So, in other words, if you have a sequence of bilinear uh, compact operator conversion in operator norm, uh, then the limit has to be compact too. And this is of great use, uh, and in the linear case too, is because. But in particular, when one look at singular integral, because this allows you to uh, regularize thing and look at much smoother operator, uh, as long as you have a sequence that converts to the operator you want uh, in the operator norm, then you can do whatever you want with each of the approximating one. And you can use any property about them that doesn't need to be passed to the limit. The only thing that passes to the limit is the norm. So uh, it allows you to work with operators that are much easier to handle. Okay, so um, here is, uh, when, when ARPA approached me, then we, we say, okay, that's simple what a compact operator by linear is. We look at some of the property uh, that we can study and they say, oh, let, let's find an application. And, and here is one. Uh, so the same result of Uchiyama Hall also in the bilinear setting. Um, and uh, we have that, um, so again, the one and the two here, you know, commutating one or the other entry. Uh, if the symbol B is in CMO, these operators are compact in the same range that you will expect. Well, except that, uh, notice here, uh, there is a restriction, uh, air R bigger to one. So what we would like to have here is R bigger than one half. And I'll, I'll just show you in a second that that's still true, but that was the first result we have. And then with uh, ARPA and uh, Damien and Moen, we extended this to um, the fractional integral case. Uh, and again, the fractional integral case is, is often 
um, a little bit uh, easier to handle, but um, we, we wanted to look at them too. Right? So regarding the range, and I'll come back to that, then uh, we were able to stand, it rely on, on a compact result uh, about sets, one set is compact in LP, and uh, it result that go back to Kolmogorov. Um, so uh, Freshek, it's usually called the Freshek Kolmogorov result. Um, it's better known for R bigger than one, uh, but there is an extension uh, for R smaller than one. And so um, in a subsequent work with Shui and Yang, we extended the result to R uh, bigger to one half. So uh, we already have with Benny the result bigger than one. And so the, the, the full range, actually with Benny, we also got the R equal to one. Um, we, we get the full range of exponent uh, that one would like to have. So a complete analogy with uh, the linear case and with Uchiyama result. Okay, so the next question is, um, okay, so if the symbol has some uh, properties, then the operate, the commutators are either uh, bounded or compact. Uh, how necessary is this? So uh, maybe we are asking too much. And so uh, a lot of people look at uh, this, the necessary and sufficiency of uh, these uh, conditions. Of course, we know they are sufficient by now, but how about are they really necessary? And both for compactness, one, one if, sorry, for boundary, we can say why is a BMO uh, a necessary condition? And for compactness, is CMO a necessary condition? Now, I, I won't get into technical details, but you always had to put some restriction on the operator too, right? Because uh, zero uh, is always a Calderon Sigmon operator, the operator identically zero, and you can commute it with, you know, with a distribution, even if you want, if you find a way to define it, and you're gonna get zero, right? So, um, and so that, uh, you know, it will be everything you want on the operator. So there has to be some uh, technical restriction, non-triviality on the operator so that uh, one can look at this uh, uh, necessity for B. Uh, being either in BMO or CMO. And there are a lot of results along those lines. Um, I just listed a few there. Koeman, Rockwell, Y, originally even proved that for the Hilbert transform, it's a necessary and sufficient B being in BMO to be bounded. And also Uchiyama in his original work proved that being in CMO, again, provided there's some known degeneracy on the operator is necessary and sufficient. And, and then there's a whole list and there are new proof and you know a, you know more generalization on the operator and so on. and so this this continued to be an active area of research as you can see by the latest result by Lerner and Brosi, Rivera and Rio and Hayton in that I point out there. Okay, so all these results are for the uh, were for the linear situation. So you again, uh, it's a natural question to ask. Uh, is the same still true in the bilinear or multilinear case? So the first result uh, was obtained by uh, Lucas Shafi, that he's a former student of mine, um, and he showed that um, both for the fractional integral and for um, so the fractional integral, there are no restrictions. It's a very specific operator for a Calderon sigmoid a bilinear Calderon sigmoid operator. Again, there's some non-degeneracy, you know, some non-vanishing on a certain way uh, of the operator, uh, then while you are, when you are in those cases, um, then uh, um, the, um, the commutator of a bilinear or multilinear operator, in this case, I join the bilinear case, uh, is bounded if and only if uh, the symbol B is in BMO. Um, so, the, in fact, the operator norm is comparable to the BMO norm of the function. We know before it was controlling the norm, now we know it's uh, a bound from below, uh, the equivalent. Right. Now, notice again, uh, here, uh, one over R is smaller than one, that means R has to be bigger than one. But again, as, as with many of these results, there's some extra work that needs to be done to extend the range, but usually the full range hold too. 
And that was then uh, done by one uh, shoe and 10. All right. So how about compactness? So that answered the question about boundness. Uh, yes, B, B, and BMO is a necessary and sufficient condition. How about B, B, and CMO for the compactness of bilinear operator? So uh, the first result was with, uh, again, with Shafi, about that um, uh, joint work with myself. Um, and so we show that this is the case for the I alpha. And, and I put I alpha one. Uh, it, it doesn't matter, it's completely symmetric. You can put commutator on the other variable too, right? So um, these two conditions are, are equivalent. So again, uh, it's a necessary and sufficient condition for the commutator to be compact uh, for the symbol to be in CMO. Now, um, I say this, sorry, I repeat it myself many times, but the fact that the alpha is a positive operator um, give us some advantage and, and so, uh, essentially, all what we did in this proof, um, we, which, which was different than what is done in the in the linear case, um, uh, we, we wanted to take a different approach. None of what we did really work for Calderon sigma operator. So we we really need to uh, completely scratch and do something different uh, for Calderon sigma operator. Um, but but uh, we were able to do it, and uh, and so again, um, part of the trouble was uh, identifying which kind of bilinear Calderon sigma operators we need to work with. And what it was crucial at is that they were homogeneous, and they again had some appropriate non-degeneracy, which I'm not going to define because it would play no much role in the rest of this talk. So, but I'll give you an example or, or actually two N examples. Um, if you are in the multilinear case, uh, sorry, in the bilinear case here and you are in RN, uh, then you can define these sort of risk transforms. Um, and, but now if you have uh, two N variables on which uh, you can do the risk transform in the Y variable or in the C variable, right? And so these are prototypical operator for which uh, one can prove necessary and sufficient condition. And, and so um, again, you can commute in either of the variable. And this was then a work with, uh, in addition to Jaffe, Chen, Han, and uh, Leslie War. And uh, we show that um, again, um, this is a necessary and sufficient condition um, for this operator to be compact is that the symbol is in CMO. Okay, so, um, so but I wanna talk about pseudo differential operators and um, you know, pseudo differential operator are Calderon Sigmund operators. So, um, or at least some classes of pseudo differential operator. The one I'm going to look at, the ones that are operator of order zero within the Hormander classes. Um, these are, uh, and, and see it misspelled there, sorry. Um, the, these are Calderon Sigmon operators. So all the uh, sufficient results still apply to them, but they are nicer than Calderon Sigmon operator. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, they are not homogeneous. They are, they are symbols, uh, they are kernels, are not homogeneous function. So um, the sufficient, uh, the, sorry, the necessity doesn't apply to them, um, but um, maybe something can be done. So, and, and in fact, they are nicer in many other sense to Calderon sigma operator. So there are many other properties that pseudo differential operator have the Calderon Sigmund operators don't. So for example, pseudo differential operator have better weighted estimate uh, than Calderon Sigmund operator, the general Calderon Sigmund operator. Okay, so there is, I, I was, I don't know, remember why I was familiar with this uh, result of course, uh, going back to 75, which is not very well known. And I'll tell you why it's not very well known. <clears throat> so um, he studied both boundedness and uh, compactness of commutator uh, of uh, 
Hormon multiplier or, or more general pseudo differential operators. And so, so I wrote there what is the, uh, the definition of a Hormon multiplier is the usual one. You have a multiplier function who the Fourier transform you multiply by a function sigma that has this type of behavior. Every time um, you take a derivative in alpha, you decrease the power of one plus C by the order of alpha. Uh, in fact, one can add an X there. So it could be a pseudo differential operator now. And provided that the derivatives uh, of the function in X don't, don't change uh, the expression on the right hand side. Okay, and so uh, what Kors did is he has some result for boundness from which then he worked further to obtain compactness. And he looked at this space that he called A infinity. Uh, these are the bounded say infinity functions whose derivatives, not the function itself, but the derivatives tend to zero at infinity, no particular rate, anything like that. So these are, you know, bounded functions, say infinity, and the derivatives, uh, but not the function itself, tend to zero at infinity. Okay. And so he looked at the closure of this space in L infinity, and proved that um, the commutator of this uh, multiplier with the function b, defined in the usual way is compact in LP for all P between one and infinity. Okay, so to me, the reason why this was uh, interesting, uh, this paper is interesting, but you know, perhaps over the time of history was overlooked then is because uh, this was done in 75. So this precede the Koeman, Rothberg and Weiss um, result about commutator of singular integral. And so, I guess courts never thought that uh, you don't really need the B to be an L infinity function. And so his result about boundedness are weaker than what then was established. So actually it's a triviality. If you put a function that is L infinity, the boundedness is, is trivial, right? Uh, and, and then he used this boundedness to prove compactness, but I think the only restriction he had is because he didn't know, because at the time was not known, that you actually can put B in BMO, not just in L infinity. So, so this will come up again in a second, right? Okay, anyway, it's, it's a result about uh, compactness. And again, um, it makes you wonder whether you can put a function uh, B in a larger space, because at least for boundedness, you don't need um, you don't need the function to be bound for bounding of the operator. You don't need the function B to be bounded. Um, it will be enough to be in BMO. So, you know, since I knew this about this word, I said, well, let, let's see what we can say about bilinear uh, pseudo differential operators. So, uh, before we do that, I need to introduce several spaces. <clears throat> So uh, the first one is, uh, so again, we have the A infinity space that core consider, but then, um, then I, I'm not sure why we call it MMO, I guess it's moderate mean oscillation or something like that. Um, we, um, we say, well, you know, at least for the boundness, you don't need uh, to take the closure in L infinity. You don't need the function to be in L infinity to be bounded. So for the operator to be bounded. So let's take the closure in BMO instead of L infinity. So in the previous result, he was taking the closure of A infinity in L infinity itself. But uh, then we say, no, let, let's take that closure in a larger space in, in BMO. So, so this is a larger space. And then we realized that well, why we had, so in fact, our first result we never published uh, was involved in this space. So we proved compactness of bilinear pseudo differential operator when the symbol was in this space. Um, and we were very happy with that, but, but then we look again, you know, before we publish it and say, hey, wait a minute, uh, maybe not only we should put BMO here, but we should put BMO here. 
So as you see, instead of having now the symbol to be in C infinity intersection L infinity, now we ask C infinity intersection BMO. So again, this is a large space, then the other conditions are the same. And of course, this is a subset of all the functions, C infinity, which the function and all its derivatives are in BMO. It's clearly all the derivatives are gonna be in BMO because they are bounded function, because they go to zero infinity. Um, and, and so this is a subspace of this much larger space. Okay, and then um, we say, well, let's take the closure of um, this space, not in L infinity, but on BMO. And we call it XMO because we didn't know which this space was. And then we have, now is the Saracen space, uh, VMO, which is the closure of this space in BMO or the closure of something that looks much smaller, which is the uniformly continuous function intersection BMO in BMO. So, so here we don't need to talk about derivative at all, but still the two spaces have the same closure in BMO. And it's a great paper that if you are interested in all these spaces, I recommend uh, by Bordeaux who, in which he studied all different definition of these spaces and, and different one and clarify many mistakes. Uh, you know, you, all of them can be fixed. So, so it doesn't change in any major result, but there are, um, he spent a lot of time going through the literature and clarifying uh, a lot of misconception and, and it's, it's, it's a great paper in that regard. So, um, uh, here we have, oh yeah, I remember now what we call it MMO because uh, it interpolate, if you interpolate between C and X, you get M, the middle letters. So that's why um, we, we call it MMO. So, um, so we have these clear inclusions, right? Uh, CMO uh, obviously is much smaller than this. Um, we, we don't know about this because you see here, you know, spaces, you start with spaces that are uh, very different, apparently, but they are closer in BMO, produce the same thing. And then we have VMO, the Saracen space. So um, the inclusion are clear, but they, you know, and, and certainly if they break in somewhere in between because CMO is smaller than VMO, but uh, we needed to understand further this, right? So we again, we look at the paper of Bordeaux and he showed that there is a function in L infinity take, in B infinity taking away L infinity at a positive distance uh, when you take the distance in the BMO norm from L infinity. So in other words, there is a, a function in B, oh, the closure of this B space is what we call CMO, that it cannot be approximated in BMO by L infinity functions, much less than by uh, L infinity function with other conditions. So. Uh, that clearly answer uh, the first question that uh, MMO is smaller than XMO. And then we look at um, a characterization of CMO given by Uchiyama. And so um, using this characterization, uh, we were able to construct the function that shows that CMO is smaller than MMO. And so the last inclusion that needed to be addressed, and in our paper, uh, which we, we couldn't address that, is whether XMO was VMO or not. And recently, uh, Tao, Shui, Shuang, and Shuang uh, again construct the function and also gave a characterization, which is along these lines, um, of this space XMO. So now we know that all the inclusion are strict. So this doesn't play any role in, in the proof of the result, but we want to make sure that we have something different, right? And so um, again, let me go back. These are all uh, different space, subspaces of BMO. They are all strictly contained. So uh, it was good that this space was already larger, so we weren't repeating the result about Calderon Sigmon operator, so we have something more to consider. But then, as I say, uh, when we realized that there was this other space, we thought this could be the appropriate way to work with, and, and that's what we did. Now, 
uh, I'd say I'd come back to this later. We don't know if one can take these, right? We we don't have sufficient uh, necessary condition, but we have sufficient one. Okay, so uh, let me move back forward. So, um, in fact, we can look at a little more general than just pseudo differential operator, but not that much. Um, so again, we we prove the result for calderon sigmon operator by linear calderon sigmon operators, which um, had the usual kernel representation when you stay away from the support of F intersection G. Uh, the kernel has the usual estimate, uh, you know, for alpha less than or equal to one. But then we ask another condition is that at infinity, so to speak, so when when uh, x minus y or x minus c is large, uh, then you have an additional decay. Uh, so, you know, the function decay that uh, this expression to the power minus 2n, the derivative, the first derivative to the power minus 2n minus alpha, uh, and so on for our derivative. But, but now we have, we want to be able to put a higher number in there. So there is a further decay at infinity. Uh, on the estimate, on the typical estimate of the kernel. So no, not every calderon sigmon operator satisfies the in particular, and this is good because otherwise there will be something wrong and will be violating other things that have improved. I cannot be an homogeneous symbol, right? An homogeneous symbol will not satisfy this. Um, so um, are there any example? Yes, of course. Uh, any uh, koeman meyer multiplier um, or in fact, pseudo differential operator uh, on, in the same kind of class um, will satisfy this, this estimate. So it's true that this operator had calderon sigmund kernel, both in the linear and multilinear case, and will have also uh, a further decay of the kernel. In fact, since this, you have estimate on all the derivative of the symbol, you also get estimate on all the derivative of the kernel. And you can prove estimate the decay as fast as you want, uh, still polynomially. But uh, the, the the number n I have before for this uh, operator, you can put n equal one thousand if you want. They are of course changing the constant. Right? Okay. So uh, the new result then uh, we finally got to that after all uh, this uh, background uh, is that. Um, if T is a bilinear calderon sigmor operator who kernel satisfy you know, the standard estimate and the additional decay, then for every uh, P and Q in, in the usual range and R given also in the usual range, you know, and, and we are able to go all the way to one half. And then for any symbol in XMO, the commutator are compact operators uh, in the same range of exponent where they are bounded. So um, I think, how much time I have? You have essentially until three o'clock. Oh, okay, so I have, I, I don't wanna go over all the details, but since I still have time, I, I wanna point out some of the ingredient on the proof um, and, and get an opportunity to mention uh, other results by other people that you may find the interesting if you, if you never uh, seen them before. Uh, so uh, one is a result about uh, kind of convolution operator with uh, absolutely conversion in there. So, so in principle, this will be a simpler operator that Calderon, bilinear calderon sigmon operator because we have a positive kernel again, and we can assume is is the integral makes sense as an absolutely conversion integral. So, um, it doesn't take much to show that if you have a function h which is in L one of of Rn cross Rn, then just by Minkowski inequality, you get that this operator map LP cross LQ into LR, again, one over Q, one, one over P plus one over Q equal one over R, uh, provided the R is larger or equal than one. And the operator norm is controlled by the L1 norm of this function. Okay, so one can say, well, we're using Minkowski inequality, that's a restriction on the R. Uh, how about R smaller than one? Well, the situation is more complicated, surprisingly, and, and Grafakos and Soria, it's a very nice paper, um, they show that the integrability of H is not necessary. 
um, sorry, is necessary uh, if the operator is positive, but it's not sufficient. So you had to ask something else on H to be able to prove boundary of this kind of bilinear convolution operator. So just the kernel uh, being integrable is not sufficient. And the condition is, it's a little complicated in appearance, but when one goes the proof, see why this is, is necessary. Um, essentially, you want uh, this kind of uh, decreasing or non-increasing on each variable of the function h, and then you need to impose this additional integrability condition. Okay, so when r is smaller than one, this is what replaces the integrability of h. You have a, a uh, a stronger different condition, but that is sufficient um, to be bounded uh, from LP cross LQ to LR. And in fact, they, they, they don't have necessary and sufficient condition, but they um, it come close to be in, in a certain sense. So um, again, that's a nice paper. So um, we needed to use something similar. So uh, we modify, I mean, I, I, I don't claim any, Credit on this is really a, a reformulation of their proof. Uh, the result uh, per se doesn't particularly directly apply to the operator I want to consider, but the proof does. So, you know, uh, it's really a corollary of their result. And, and we're going to consider different type of positive operators. So here is something that is uh, integrable at infinity, but locally zero. So uh, that uh, shouldn't be much problem. Here is something the other way around you is locally integrable for x and y small uh, and it vanish at infinity so this violate the uh, sorry this this violate the decreasing condition um, and then something that is in in an annulus so it's bounded between you know it's not zero between delta and one and then finally one that is the combination of the two so so using their idea one can easily prove that all these operators are bounded uh, from LP cross LQ into LR. And, and here, the, 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 the part that requires some proof is really are smaller than one. And these are the norms of the operator, or at least an estimate on the norm of the operator. OK. Um, so um, like Uchijama originally and, and the work with Benny and many others that follow, um, we require uh, to use this Frischet Kolmogoro result. And, and this is, that has nothing to do with operator. This has to do with uh, subspaces of LR. And, um, and it tells you when it is set, it's a, it's a characterization actually, one is set uh, is pre-compact, right? Uh, so then typically how you apply this when you study compact operator, this set is the image, let's say, of the uniball uh, under the action of the operator, right? So um, this is the set that you want to show the closure of which is compact. So, um, so these three conditions need to be satisfied for the element in the set. The set has to be bounded in LR. That's, that's easy to prove, usually, because that follows from the boundedness of the operator. If you're dealing with a bounded operator, that, then there's nothing to prove really here. And the other two um, are the following. They're kind of continuity condition. One is that the tails, so the LR tail of the functions in this set, uh, go uniformly to zero. So of course, they are in LR, so they, this will go to zero but they need to go to zero uniformly in our element of the set, right? And the other, again, is, is a continuity is in terms of the norm, the, the translation by small t, uh, which of course, this, this is the continuity of translation in the norm, but again, it has to be uniformly in the set, right? And so if you can verify these three conditions, again, the one, the first one is, is a given for the image of, of a set by an, a bounded operator. So really, if you verify these two conditions, then you can guarantee that you have a pre-compact set, and that's what required for the operator to be compact. Okay. And, and then, as I mentioned earlier, uh, um, we first weren't aware of this, but then we learned uh, that an extension to the case R smaller than one was done by a Japanese mathematician, Jutsui, in 1951, okay. This is a very old result. I don't know how old it goes back, but 
uh, then there was an, you know, by all means now, uh, my kids, for example, would think this is very old, right? I, I still don't think it's that old, but <laughs> um, it depends on your age. Okay, uh, so again, by symmetry is enough to consider, let's say, commutator in one variable. And um, from, um, from the estimate that we have, so on the boundedness of the operator, um, which only requires the symbol to be in BMO. Now we're working in some subspace of BMO. Uh, from the boundedness, uh, with this estimate that the operator norm depend on the BMO norm of the function B, uh, you see that we can just retreat to B and V. We need to prove this for the closure of this space. But since the limit, remember, of compact operator is compact, uh, in, even in the bilinear K, and this only depend on the norm of the function B, then we can restrict to these functions, right? So these take care of, of one um, trickier thing, which will be, you know, who knows what, I, what is in the closure of this space, but we don't need to look, work with the closure. We need only to work with the space B infinity then so. And um, also if we need it by some, uh, and I, I don't remember if we use it or not, but, um, and I will not show in, in the detail I, I have here, but um, we can also assume that the function maybe are say infinity with compact support if we need to, right? So that's another limiting process that uh, can be applied and simplify things a lot. And, and it's all given just by the estimate on the boundedness of the operator, right? So that, that is, is a fair big step. Um, so in this case, what is that we need to show? Well, uh, we can either show this function are bounded or, or, you know, depending on the norm of this function, there's these two conditions. The set is the image. Uh, so the action of T on, on F and G. So that is going to, if you restrict F and G, that's going to give you a bounded set because of the same estimate. So all what we need to show is that uh, this uniformly LR integrability when, when uh, A is sufficiently large, this is arbitrarily small, and also the continuity. Right, and I don't know how much I, I want to go over this, but um, what we do is we consider three situations where, uh, and this is for those of you who work in the area, it's fairly typical, either uh, uh, Y and C are very close to X, uh, one of them is far away, or they are in some region in between, right? And then the, the method go to uh, splitting this in several parts. And perhaps the only thing to show here why we need the derivative of the function to go to zero. Um, and is that you get an estimate that depend on the uh, supremum of the gradient for C large. And this is one of the kind of operators that uh, in that lemma following uh, Soria, uh, Grafakos and Soria, um, we can estimate. So uh, at the end, everything depends on the size of the gradient of B for C large. And since this goes to zero, we can make this, uh, picking A appropriate, we can make this arbitrary small. Okay, so the, the other term is very similar. Again, a different kind of operator under the uh, Grafaco Soria result, but uh, again, it's multiplied by the gradient. And, and then um, um, in this one, uh, we use now that we have the full gradient. So this doesn't go to zero, but uh, remember for an operator of a convolution of this type, the norm uh, of this operator depend uh, like one, uh, A to the minus one. So when we make A go to infinity, again, this, um, these become very small, right? Um, and that's what I just said. And then finally, the continuity is more uh, difficult. I, I don't want to get into that, but let me just say that here is when we need an additional regularity on the function B. Um, and, uh, and after that, you know, several similar estimates. Okay, so uh, I'm all about the time. So these are, uh, I think these are all the references I mentioned today. Um, be happy to share this if someone wants to see. 
Um, so all these uh, different results uh, about uh, commutator, this, this result uh, is about, uh, I don't think I explicitly mentioned, but here uh, we show uh, with uh, Benny, Maldonado, and Naivo that um, the estimate on the kernel uh, of a pseudo differential operator satisfy the Calderon Sigmund condition with an extra decay and infinity. Uh, this is the, the paper of Bordeaux. I, I recommend people to take a look at if you're interested in, in, in all these uh, subspaces of BMO and even in the local setting. Um, and these are the different results about compactness. Um, measure of this. Uh, this is the paper of Hall, the motivated D, and the result of Grafaco and Soria, also very interesting uh, result. And, and here is one application of this compactness result. Um, and uh, I think uh, these are all the uh, reference I, I use. Okay, so this may have appeared since since then, I haven't updated this, but um, and my uh, the, the work with uh, Shue that I just talked about uh, appeared in 2020 in the Revista Mathematica Iberoamerica. Okay, so I think I'll stop here and um, I'll be happy to answer uh, any question if there are any. Thank you, Rodolfo. Thank you very much. It was a great talk.